Canto VI opens with us still amongst the turbulent and agitated souls of those who died violently, but one also senses died with a lot of unsettledness, discontent in their own souls. And they crowding around, um, particularly Dante now, um, sensing that this living person might have some blessing to offer, um, particularly in that he can return to earth and request the prayers of those still living to try and help those who are in purgatory. Um, they're in this rather unthinking state um, that you know trauma often brings. It struggles to see the way that this might actually work, which is about an openness of heart that allows them to take love in and so move on. And Dante begins the canto with a very powerful simile describing this. Um, he talks about what it's like to see a dice game coming to the end where the loser gets left behind and the winner gets crowded by those seeking to have some small offering from his winnings um, and the winner sure enough to kind of find a way through the crowd away from the crowd throws down the occasional coin um, and it makes you wonder you know why Dante uses this similarly now um, it's quite interesting because um, some of the commentators treat it allegorically. Um, remember, we were talking about these different levels of reading things, and they resort to an allegorical reading, um, a lower kind of reading, you might say, um, and ask, you know, is Dante aligning himself with the loser here, um, or is he aligning himself with the winner here? Um, and the debate, uh, you know, it might be the loser because. Um, he feels that he's not yet with his beloved Beatrice, or it might be the winner because he knows that he's on his way to heaven. I think it's a combination of both, giving us the spiritual insight that you can feel more than one thing at any given time. And you can imagine the jangle of feelings that Dante feels. You know, on the one hand, he's been treated like a winner. He seems to be blessed by the souls around him but he feels a fraud. On the one hand, you know, he just wants to kind of keep on walking, keep on pursuing his own journey, and so sort of wants to be free of them. On another hand, I think he's beginning to sense that their requests themselves are misguided because they're too mechanical, because they're not getting the deeper insight, which he himself is beginning to get. The poem remarks that they prayed only that others might pray for them, and Dante's beginning to realise that, and feel actually, not just realise in his mind, but feel in his very person that it's openness of heart that counts, you know, which is why he has a greater sense of both self-possession and being able to um, empathise with them. Um, that is a state actually of integrity to offer both, but it's hard and he's still learning it and he feels quite overwhelmed at this point. And also, you know, more subtly as well, not sure what to say to them, what to teach them. Um, they are in a state where they can't feel what he is beginning to sense. Um, and that is a very difficult place to be in. It's a bit like being with a child when you can't explain why they can't have X or Y, um, because they just won't understand it. Um, and you have to just say, I'm sorry, you can't have it. Um, it's, it's a hard position to hold. Um, but Dante does honour their request nonetheless, um, uh, sort of honouring them in that, because he then does list um, a handful or two of the souls that um, rush up round him now um, as if to remember them on earth, but also honouring their intent, their desire, because if they're asking specifically for the wrong thing, then um, their desire is actually pointing in the right direction. Um, it will resolve itself in time, um, which is why they're here in purgatory. But it leads to a discussion um, with Virgil, between Dante and Virgil, um, that develops these themes, because Dante does, in fact, say to Virgil at this point, I think this is Dante the pilgrim really struggling with these things, he does turn to Virgil, um, oh my light, he says, um, can the laws of the cosmos be bent by prayerful requests? 
and he notes that this is something Virgil had himself written about um, in the Aeneid. And Virgil turns to Dante and says, that is indeed what I once wrote, but now I understand more. I understand particularly the new law, which has been alluded to um, a few times now in the purgatory, um, that love actually is a more basic and powerful dynamic in the cosmos than, say, law or justice. And this is something which has been intimated. Um, I think that Virgil is really getting it now. Um, and so we note that this is part of Virgil's pilgrimage to part of him moving into the new consciousness, the new dispensation um, that sees um, the personal deity um, as the ultimate um, nature of the cosmos. This would be the Christian view rather than, say, um, the deity of fate, um, which in the old Greek uh, pantheistic view, even the gods had to obey. Um, so it's a really interesting moment where we see Virgil showing some of his new light, not just some of the old light that he lived by. I think he shows something about how this works as well. It's not just that a, now a new god of love somehow rules rather than the old god of justice. Um, it is about a change um, within his own sight um, because um, he adds um, to Dante that um, the old ways didn't have access to God, um, by which I think that means that um, in a way they were praying for the wrong things. And if you pray for the wrong things, that that in part keeps you trapped um, in um, the worldview that um, is causing those prayers to arise. Um, it's a bit like the thought we had in the last canto that um, the secret prayers of the heart um, can actually lead you powerfully astray unless you question the secret prayers of your heart as well. And um, because then the prayers themselves can open up the desire, the intent, um, uh, the will for your life can open up and uh, move into less certain ground, less sort of possessive grasping ground, um, which the poor agitated souls um, of this part of purgatory are still rather caught up in, um, call all that into question and so open up, become more expansive, um, which does seem very much that that's what's happening to Virgil now as he moves on, even from what he'd written in such a splendid way, um, while he was alive and is beginning to see new things now. Um, but he also knows that um, if it's not just about a new God, not just about questioning your own desire and intent and so opening up, he also knows that sometimes these things can only be seen, they can't quite be told, because he then says to Dante, but look, hold on, um, what's true and what your intellect can grasp um, it's going to take time to really come together, um, but it will because we'll meet Beatrice at the top of the mountain. Now this is a truly fascinating remark from Virgil. Immediately raises the question, how does he know? He's not been here before. Um, it momentarily at least throws Dante off um, because at the name of Beatrice, um, he, of course, is instantly put in touch with the love that's the most powerful and basic force in the cosmos, and so feels instantly revived. Um, it's in perhaps a rather teenage kind of way, just the name of Beatrice fills him with new energy. Um, but nonetheless, it's kind of a demonstration of Virgil's insight um, that love is more powerful than law. Um, but we just want to hang back a minute and ask, you know, how does Virgil know and um, quite what is he saying as well, um, rather than just, as it were, dangling um, the carrot of Beatrice's presence before Dante at this point. I think he knows in a prophetic way. Um, this is very much my interpolation, but I think that he's putting two and two together at this point. He knows that Beatrice um, is um, the most proximate love that's moved Dante. Um, he's talking about how love actually can change all things. So he is going to um, prophesy now that they'll meet Beatrice at the top of the mountain. Um, you know, not prophesy in the sense of, you know, make a, a random uh, guess, a bit like the throw of the dice um, at the beginning of the canto, um, but more um, a deep intuition that this is going to be so. And 
um, it has wisdom in it too because um, this business about um, the prayers of the suffering calling for divine help um, and whether divine um, justice um, bends uh, towards it or not um, is of course you know a really deep religious problem um, for those who believe in a benign loving God and yet find themselves in a state of agitation and torment and being the victims of violence too. Don't forget that that is very much around still at this moment in the canto. And I think what Virgil is intimating here is that there's a way in which these things, the benign God and the existence of suffering, can only be resolved from um, a different point of view. When you're in the thick of it, you have to resort in a way to um, the more clumsy, um, desperate, but heartfelt responses of, of, of asking for prayer, of begging for prayer. But he's intimating that there is another point of view where these things do get reconciled, when they do make sense. And that makes some sense to me um, because I think one of the things which happens in psychotherapy um, is that people do bring genuine suffering, but also um, often very unjust suffering as well. Um, you know, you think about things like abuse. Um, and whilst there's a right period of life where that must be wrestled with, struggled with, um, it, it, it is trauma, it must be experienced, there's another moment in life when it can be looked back on and understood it can be held, you might say, in a wider context, which ultimately is a context of love. Um, the kind of love, not that glibly forgives all, but the kind of love which sees all and can live with all. And of course, that is very much what this journey has been about. Dante has seen the worst of the worst in the depths of the inferno. And I think Virgil is just beginning to sense at this point um, that all that um, is truly terrible um, in life, there is a point of view where this can actually be sat with and held and lived with and transcended. But it must come at the right moment, because if it comes too early, um, it feels actually terribly unjust. It makes um, out that um, the love that runs through all the cosmos is um, a, a careless love. It doesn't care for people. It just rides roughshod over the terrible things which actually do happen to people. So anyway, there's a lot going on um, in this exchange between Dante and Virgil. A lot of subtlety, but subtlety increasingly becomes the way as we move through purgatory. What seems like a nuanced point at first, we realise actually is a deeper truth of the cosmos and um, our minds, our hearts, our desire, our sight, our knowledge can take that on board. Given the time, Virgil indirectly says to a now excited Dante, excited by the sound of Beatrice's name, look, it's going to take more than a day to get up this mountain. Um, it's going to take more than a cycle of day and night, of light and darkness, to really process these things. And um, so they keep walking and then they see in the distance um, a solitary soul, and he's sitting, Dante remarks um, quite majestically, um, his gaze is steady, um, Virgil immediately, I think again with his intuitive sight, really quite focused at this point, um, realises that um, this chap will be able to tell them the way to go. He sees that um, this soul has the self-possession of wisdom, of reflection, of having his own mind, and so intuits that he will know how they should step out next. So they approach him. At first, he rather ignores them. Um, one reason why that might be so, actually, is that um, when Virgil was saying to Dante, it'll take more than a day to get to the top of the mountain to get to see Beatrice, um, he remarked as well that, in fact, the sun has already reached um, a stage in the afternoon where they're now in shadow, um, which means, of course, that Dante's shadow can't be seen. Um, so this soul that they're approaching doesn't realise that Dante's alive, um, so he kind of stays in his own self-possession. Um, but when Virgil asks, um, what's the way to go, the soul asks back, you know, tell me where you're from. Um, I think he is 
indicating his state of mind there by asking that. He's indicating that he is in a state of introspection. He's asking who he is, where he's from, what's happened in his life, what's gone wrong. Um, you might say that he is in now a significantly different state from the agitated uh, souls running around desperately with one prayer that they are prayed for. He has taken some of that into himself now um, and is in a state of meditation almost, uh, reflecting upon his life, um, which of course is to call his earlier prayers into question. Um, his heart is changing, it's opening up in his state of uncertainty. Virgil answers the question, where are you from, uh, by saying he's from Mantua, and immediately this soul leaps up, and it turns out that he's from Mantua too. Um, he's from uh, the same city as Virgil, and the two embrace. And I just wonder whether this embrace is not just um, uh, the embrace of people from the same place, um, lovely though that is, and perhaps especially when you're in a strange place where everything's changing and it's quite hard to work out what's going on, um, a sort of a solidarity experience between um, this new soul and Virgil. Um, but um, I think it's also that the two souls recognise something in each other. You know, if I'm right in my intimation that Virgil um, is now seeing quite clearly, he has um, some quite substantial sense of the wisdom of this new place. And the soul they've just encountered too has been reflecting upon that, um, getting some of that deeper insight for himself. And then why wouldn't the two souls recognise each other and embrace at this point? And um, it turns out it's going to be quite an elaborate embrace, um, as we'll see when we get to the next canto. Um, but he is Sordello, um, and he is a poet, um, and in particular, he is a poet of lament about war. Um, that is what he's remembered for. Um, some of that writing of his still survives, um, and the commentators note that this is what Dante will have um, uh, recognised him for. So it's sort of appropriate that he's in this moment in purgatory, um, because lament is part of what's required to move to this new attitude towards suffering. Um, you know, when there's the trauma of suffering, that's one stage. Um, but then there comes a stage of grieving about what's happened to one, um, of realising the cost, of realising what was lost, of realising the offence, of realising how, you know, human beings, perhaps those very close to you, um, powerfully, powerfully um, let you down and maybe even try to destroy you in the case of those who died violent deaths. So this much softer emotion, um, and therefore a heart-changing emotion of lament, of grief, um, is really important. And Sordello devoted a good chunk of his earthly life to that, so finds himself now in this state of mind, this part of purgatory. And it's really interesting what impact this has upon Dante, the pilgrim, because he immediately launches into a bitter, sarcastic even, but profound lament for what he's seen in his own life. Um, the memory of Beatrice um, seems to vanish. Um, it probably was um, a rather sort of teenage, still rather infatuated response to hearing her name, so didn't go very deep, um, so slips away quite quickly. Um, but the rest of the canto, um, a long part of this canto, is taken up with Dante, first of all inveighing against um, Italy that's been so slavish to violence. Um, then he inveighs against the Caesars, um, the kings, the rulers who should have been able to impart some peace and failed terribly um, in his own lifetime and in that of his most recent ancestors. Um, he even laments um, against God um, and says, you know, you who were crucified, um, supposedly for our well-being, um, have you turned your eyes from us? Um, do you not see the state we're in? Um, that is the extent to which this grief and lament must go. Um, incidentally, just as a side, and this is really interesting, um, in the Purgatory, as in the Inferno, um, Dante always refers to God as Jupiter or as Jove, um, using the old words, the old dispensations, names for God. 
Um, and I think this is his intimating that although he's calling on God, he doesn't know fully what he's calling on in this lament. Um, he's giving, as it were, God the old name, the sort of wrong name. He doesn't see fully um, the way of God now himself, um, which of course is true because he's in the lament, he's in the grief, and he hasn't yet reached the vision of Beatrice um, that has this very different relationship to suffering. And then finally, he turns to Florence and uh, deeply bitterly, deeply sarcastically um, invades against his own city. Um, uh, how uh, hypocritical it is, how unable it has been to live up to um, its uh, best ideals and best goals um, and best past. Um, so, you know, Dante the poet giving Dante the pilgrim this long lamentation at the end of Canto VI, um, is really important. Um, it's not just um, the poet having a chance to rehearse some of um, what's gone wrong um, in his own life and times. Um, it's a key part of the process. And I think, you know, for us as readers, reminds us that um, we mustn't rush too quickly to the end of the comedy, even though, you know, we probably know um, that the end is good, because you only get to that good end, not just if you go into the descent of Inferno, but also go through the genuine lamentation and grief of the purgatory. And, you know, it can be sarcastic, it can be bitter, um, it needs to be full-hearted to open the heart up, but it also needs to have a focus, it needs to have a kind of precision. And Dante now finds that as he invades against Italy, against um, the Caesars, against God, against Florence. Um, he's not now just like those other agitated souls who are running around desperately asking for others' help. The very act of lamentation and grief is itself a kind of focusing of his own mind, a key step into um, a new state of mind, a new state of being, for all that it's full of completely unashamed passion and rage. Um, everything is flowing now for Dante at this point um, in the purgatory. And the canto ends with um, a final image of discomfort, um, with the image of um, a soul on their bed, in pain, unable to find any rest.